Ten Commandments. And I've kind of geared the Ten Commandments this time, like I've never done before. It's geared to our journey with God. And talk a little bit about pain you like. What God designed. What man is trying to destroy, actually. What the enemy certainly wants to destroy, no doubt about it. We talked, uh, I began with number three because I felt it was important to understand that there is one name above all others, and that's the name Jehovah. The God of the Old Testament, whose name was Jehovah, is the Jesus in the New Testament. There is no greater name, there is no higher name, there is no name more worthy of praise and honor and glory than the name of our God. His name is Jehovah. Amen? Amen. If we could get that right, it would help us tremendously in the way that we talk in the way that we choose to use words to slander the name of God. The second thing we talked about was actually the first commandment, where it says that we, um, what does the first commandment say? Who knows? There's no other God before me. That God created everything, and he absolutely deserves everything. It all should go back to him. And this morning, we're going to tackle number two. And number two simply says in Exodus 20, in verse 4, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Pretty strong words there, huh? Let's talk about them a little bit. When we talk about the Ten Commandments, I have tried to encourage you to, to, to stay with me on this series because I think even though it's in the Old Testament, and even though this was a long time ago, God gave them to Israel and to us for a reason. We have tried to put the Ten Commandments in every home in our church family. In fact, there's about two or maybe three copies left up here that are in frames. And I would love, if you've not gotten yours yet, especially those that are just with us this morning, if you would, please, uh, come up here on the first pew. They're right there and grab you a framed copy of the Ten Commandments and post it because that's what God's Word says we ought to do. Put it out there where it's visual, where we see it, we're reminded of it. Wherever we go, whatever we do, it reminds us. So this morning we're going to talk about no graven images. You know, I, I made a statement in the beginning of this series and I said if we could get the greatest commandment down, all the rest of these would pretty much take care of themselves. <coughs> And the greatest commandment that was ever given to us is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, and all of our soul, and all of our mind. That is the greatest commandment that was ever given. That me and you are to love God, Jehovah, supremely. Can you imagine what that means as we look at the Ten Commandments? That if I'm loving God supremely, guess what? There will be no other gods before me. Because I love God supremely. It also, if I love God that way, passionately and as deep as I should love God, I'm not going to make any kind of carved image and put it in, in front or before God. And, and even the third one, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Let me tell you something. If, if I am loving God supremely with absolutely everything that I am, you know what? I wouldn't dare take the name of God in vain because it's so holy and precious. But the Lord gave us ten after he gave us the greatest. And one of those is no carved images. The Ten Commandments are not arbitrary. You understand what that means? The Ten Commandments are not arbitrary. It's not like you can uh, bet around or gamble around or try to change it in any form. The Ten Commandments are universal. The Ten Commandments are temporary. They're not, they're not a fad that came along and went away with Moses and the children of Israel. They are eternal. Forever. Forever. We do not need a new morality for a new age. 
The Ten Commandments has been settled by God. And I know there are people, some of you sitting out there, that might say, well, but you don't understand how I feel. Let me tell you something. Feeling has nothing to do with it. Your feeling and emotions are not going to change what God said. Well, you, you don't understand what I think. Well, let me tell you something. When it comes to what God says and what you or I would think, what we think, it doesn't matter. Well, but you don't know what I believe. Let me tell you something. What you believe, if it's not following the commandments of God, it's a lie. It's not true. When we transgress God's commandments, we do not break them. Think about it. The truth is that we're broken on them. You remember when Jesus went to the cross? The cross didn't break him. He was broken on the cross. <laughs> The night before when he prayed so intently that he had blood running out of his pores, of his skin, Jesus was broken, and then he went on a cross. The cross didn't break him. We don't break the, we don't break the Ten Commandments. We're broken on the Ten Commandments. When we come to see what the Word of God says and we look at that mirror called the Word of God back into our life, we realize that. This is what God says, and this is what I need to do. That's why repentance is such a big deal in the kingdom of God. God knew how much we'd need to repent. You ever read the Old Testament entirely? I, I, I cannot imagine how many times God said this, and the children of Israel did the opposite or something else. But God was a repentant. God was a forgiving God when they asked for repentance. And that's so important. Where we stand on the Ten Commandments, what we do to build those commandments into our lives, they give us strength. Every time God says you can, it, God's saying help yourself to all the blessing of following me. When God says you do not, he's saying don't go there and hurt yourself. They're protective measures to help us out. The first commandment tells us do not worship other gods but the one true God. His name is Jehovah. The second commandment tells us how to worship. So the first forbids us to have false gods. The second one forbids us to worship in a false way. You understand that? The first commandment <coughs> forbids us to have a false god in our life. The second commandment teaches us how to worship God. It forbids the false worship. It's how we worship. The greatest gift that we could ever give our children, the greatest gift that I could ever pass down to my grandsons, is that they know how to worship God truthfully. You know, there was an encounter in the Old Testament with Jesus and a woman at the well in John chapter 4. And it was all about true worship. She thought that she tried to make it all about race. Jesus wasn't about to go to the race. Because in her encounter with Jesus, Jesus tried to teach her that he is the living water. The water in that well, that's from Jacob's well, and guess what? It's not going to give you life everlasting, but he, the water of life, when you taste and drink of Jesus Christ, guess what? He saves your soul, and you have an overflowing abundance of water, spiritual water in your life. But in that conversation, the woman threw out to Jesus, he said, oh, no, 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 you Jews... You know, you worship in the city. Us Samaritans, we got to go all the way up there on Mount. Thank you. We all are in what? But they had to go to Mount Gerizim to worship. Because they couldn't worship with the Jews. And Jesus said, let me tell you something, woman. The time is coming, and it's right here and now, standing right in front of you, that people that worship God in a true way worship Him in spirit and truth. Out with the old, in with the new. So let me tell you something. Worship that does not begin at the home does not begin. The greatest gift you'll give your, your children is to teach them how to worship God. The second commandment, the one that we're studying today, it helps us to learn how we worship God properly, but it also tells us the importance of worshiping God properly. Well, I want to tell you something. There, were, there have been people in the Bible, real people,
people, real instances, and they're recorded in this word that worship God wrongly, and guess what? They die because they did it the wrong way. So if I'm going to worship God the Father, and I hope that's why you're here today, amen, amen. we want to make sure that we do it properly. So number one, there has to be that proper conception of who God is. Look at Psalm 115 for just a moment. The proper conception of who God is. Psalm 115, starting in verse 4, says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have the eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Or do they mutter through their throat? Those who make them are like them. And so is everyone who trusts in them. Wow. That is a lot. Let me tell you something. We must teach. We must learn. We must believe a true conception of who God is. If we conceive of God, that means if, if we think wrongly of God, you know what's going to happen? We're going to behave wrongly. Do you know that? My conception of God is going to dictate how I behave. The Bible says that the man thinks in his heart, what? So, so is he. That's what he is. So let me tell you something. We need to get it right. Our conception of God ought to be spot on. If what we do is going to be spot on. Because if we conceive of God wrongly, we're going to behave in the wrong way. We become, I love this statement, but we become like what we worship. You know that? It's like growing up in a home. And ever heard that person in the home that influences you the most? You're, you're going to become a lot like that person. My dad's 89 years old. There's a few negatives, but there's a lot of positives in his life. And when I was young and foolish, about 18, 16, 18, 24, whatever, I thought I knew it all. And, and I did not want to become like my father. And now I'm 63 years old, and he's 89 years old, and I wish I could be like my father. Because he's the closest man I know, <coughs> intimately, very, very. See, we are what we worship. That's what we become. We do it, and we, it, it takes its form and embodies our life. It's very important that we have that proper thought, conception of who God is. We not only need to understand who God is, we need to understand what God is like. You know, God is absolutely forbidden the making of anything material as an object of worship. Do you know that? We worship the Jesus that died on the cross. We do not worship the cross. Amen. We worship the God that inhabits the praises of his people inside this building or outside. But we don't worship this building. <laughs> we, we like ourselves, but we should never let self become more valuable and important than our God. Or we're worshiping self. And we do. We'll talk about it. But God has forbidden that we should ever, ever make anything of material as an object of worship. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus saves me because he died on the cross, but the cross did not save. He did not save. God's not material. See, that's the problem we have in all of this. We, we get this wrong conception of God. I hope I can do it. Oh, my goodness. I forgot how heavy that thing was. Hmm. You see this? It's what brass, Bobby. Brass in it. <laughs> it's, it's, that brass encases something. Probably. I don't know what it is. Not, anybody know? I know they're expensive. I look them up. If I ever <laughs> um, but this is material. This is man-made. We do not worship carved images. We worship the person that this cross represents, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let me tell you something. God is not material. God is spirit. Let me tell you something. God is not 
a spirit. God is spirit. That's his essence. To worship God, we can't worship God with a physical body because God has no physical body. We have to worship him in spirit. Our soul has to connect with the spirit of who God is. No material thing can ever represent the spirit. Simple as that. So nothing that would take the place of our God would be made of material. Because you know why? God's not a material God. God is a spirit. Isaiah 40, 25 says, Who would you liken me to? Who is my equal? equal? There is nobody else to compare to God. Amen? There's nobody that can compare to Jehovah. There's only one God. And I want to tell you something about God. The God who made us and saved us is a God that put something inside of every human being. Whether they go to church or don't go to church, inside of every human being, there is a little element in our soul that desires to worship. It desires to worship. And, and let me tell you something about that. I heard a statement a long time ago. I didn't have a clue what it was, but I wrote it down. Probably spelled it wrong because I was a young preacher boy. And I went back and I looked it up. But the statement was, nature abhors a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Nature abhors a vacuum. If there is a void, no one can say why that thing once was set in motion and that it should stop being real. Nature Humankind is uniquely religious. And let me tell you what happens. If we don't worship the true God, Jehovah, we will worship something. When you read that 4,000 years of history in the Old Testament, let me tell you what you're going to find. That every time the children of Israel got off base and was not worshiping Jehovah God, you know what they did? They worshiped something else. Over and over and over. Probably the classic, most classic example is that God sends a man named Moses up on a mountain and God speaks to him and writes with his finger the original ten that look nothing like this. I couldn't even read them because they're in Hebrew and I don't, it was too hard for me. I want that. Uh, but you understand that when Moses was up on the mountain, the children of Israel were sitting down there waiting for days and days, and finally, one of them had this great idea. Well, listen, Moses is gone. We can't worship God without him. So guess what? We've got to worship something. So they began to take off their earrings and their nose rings and their eye rings and rings everywhere else, anything of gold and silver, and they melted it down and they made a calf. Why? Because deep inside of us, there is this little thing that God created and put in our souls that says that we must yearn to worship something. And we do. That's exactly what we do. Humankind is incurably religious. If we don't worship God the right way, we will worship something else in the wrong way. Nature abhors the vacuum. An idol. What is an idol? We see them. I mean, if you go to India, you'll see a lot of them. Statues of Buddha. Why is there a statue of God? God's spirit. Who would you liken me to, God said? Uh, Uh-oh. Who would I liken God? I have no idea. Jesus, would you reach up there in front of you and turn my ESPN notification? That, that oh, is that yours? Okay. Okay. It was your no, that was mine. You know, I have on the side. By her right finger. On the side. There you go. See that on and off switch up there? Got it? Okay. So let me tell you something. While Moses is up on the mountain and he's getting these ten, guess what? Uh, they worship. They didn't worship God in the right way. They worship God in the truly wrong way. Amen? I shouldn't even say anything, but I'm afraid that thing's going to go off again, and I just do not like it going off. It's real cool. You know, shut it off, just push that button, and let it go. Alright. Time out. You get it? Time in. An idol. An idol is any kind of 
kind of pure car, shape, form, fashion thing that becomes something that we love. Listen to me. We love it, we serve it, and we fear it more than we do God. We love it, we serve it, and we fear it more than we do God. That is an idol in my life. Let me tell you something. It doesn't even have to be something like that. Think about it. What do you love? What do you serve? What do you fear more than God? An idol is nothing more than a magnified sin. A man takes his worst vices. You know what we do? We make God God. Of them. Man worships those vices, and when we do, we legitimize the vice. We make it so important to us and try to explain that to others. I'm going to tell you something. Verse 5 in Exodus 20, God says, Not only have I made you, and not only do I not want there to be any other gods, and, and, and not only do I not want there to be any graven or carved images, God says, let me tell you something, I'm a jealous God. God has a spiritual jealousy for you and for me. It's holy, it's righteous. So God has every right to be jealous over us. You know why? Because God made us. And number two, there's only one God. And that's Jehovah. Many of us don't make greater than you do. We don't fashion idols out of wood. But you know what? We commit idolatry just the same. We don't wear anything around our neck. We don't put it on display in the house or anything of that nature. But we worship God in idolatry. A false God. It's at the heart. Colossians 3, 5 says, Put away covetousness. You know what covetousness is? Co covetousness is holding, wanting a bicycle because your neighbor has one. I gotta have it now. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be happy. I'm gonna have it now. He covetous. You know covetousness starts in the heart. The person with what they have deep in here, the Lord they have. God's a jealous God. He, he does not want to be compared to any image. God is a jealous God. He does not want you loving a bicycle more than you love him. Or an iPad more than you love him. Or this or that more than you love him. It's a holy, righteous jealousy. God made us. He's the only one true God. He has every right to be jealous. I'm glad he's jealous over me. I'm glad. Many of us don't make those images, but yet we don't put away covetousness. And then the rest of that verse says, which is idolatry. Uh -oh. I didn't, uh-oh, I did. I coveted that so much. It was more value to me than God was. Guess what? That is idolatry. Ezekiel 14.3 says, men who set up idols in their heart. There's so many types of false gods. Sometimes, I want to tell you, this is going to get personal, but sometimes the false god is me. Because in my heart, what's in my heart, we become our own idol. And that, that's what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy. He said, in the last days, men shall become lovers of themselves. Guess what? Loving yourself more than you love God, you're the idol that you worship. Matthew 6, 24, money. It says, no man can serve both God and money. You can't do it. But yet, we do. Pride. Family. When God has first place in our lives and we're able to love our families with that deep, passionate love and a pure love, guess what? God accepts that as worship. You remember how Jesus said it? Jesus said it in uh, Matthew 10, 37, He that loves his father and mother more than me is not... Worthy of me. Your family may be your idol because everything you do is for the family and not for God. Popularity. Somebody turn to uh, John chapter 12 and verse 42. But what happens is, John 12, 42, what happens is, is people look at their life and the opinions that other people have of them is so important. They're not going to do anything different because guess what? Opinions matter. And it's about popularity. John 12, 42. Who's got it? Read it. Read it. Set it up and read it towards the congregation. Please. <clears throat> Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise of men more than 
see there? Even in Jesus' day, men loved themselves so much that they wouldn't leave the false to go for the truth. Because the popularity of men was more important to them than anything else. Sport. My dad and I were talking about this when he was last in. And it's sad that Sunday has become a day of entertainment more than a day that we worship God. And it is. You can't lie about that. <coughs> it's entertainment. Go feel good. So there's this proper conception of God that that we need to follow, that we need to teach our children. And then there's the proper communication, the way that we teach them. How, how are we going to teach our children to worship God? Well, first thing, teach them the wrong way to worship God. If you know the legitimate way, then teach them the wrong way to worship God. Kind of look at the counterfeit money. I, Kobe does my uh, processing for me, and I gave him some money. And one of the bills, it's a hundred dollar bill, brand new. I, I kidded with him. I said, I just made them last night. <laughs> so he immediately put it up in front of the light. You can see it. You know, just but you know the people in finance, the banking industry, people that handle a lot of money, they know by touch when it's fake. So they teach them to learn what the fake is. So they know what is the real. And you know what? We need to teach our kids what wrong worship is so that they understand what true worship is. That's how we teach our children. That's what we're encouraged to do. Exodus 20 and 5, listen. That, that, is, that, is such, that is such a strong warning against wrong worship because false worship corrupts our mind. And I'm going to tell you one of the most damning, dangerous things that would ever happen is for me as a father me as a grandfather to be teaching my grandson or my two sons the wrong way to worship God. Because you know why? That jealous God named Jehovah, he takes the thought that comes from my heart and the action that follows that my children see and that my grandchildren would see and know about. And guess what? It becomes a curse to three or four <laughs> generations. Let me tell you something. Don't you ever say, listen, don't ever say, my sin does not affect anyone. Your sin will always affect someone. And most of the time, it's going to affect more than someone. Someone. And especially this, I mean, it, this thing hit me so hard several years ago. And, and it hit me so hard, I just fell on my face before God on the dirty floor in the arena with 50-something thousand other guys. And I asked God to forgive me. And then my son Jared helped me to get Michael out of his wheelchair and lay him down on that dirty floor on his face. And then Jared lay down beside him. And we held hands and we connected and we prayed. First minute, I prayed, God, I don't know what's in my family life. I know my grandpa, and he was not a believer. And his dad was not a believer. And my great-great-grandfather is not a believer. So I'm asking you now in the name of Jesus, Christ, whatever curse there may be in my family lineage, please, in Jesus' name, stop that curse. Amen. I believe it's strong as well. <clears throat> we cried. We had dirty tears all over our faces by the time we got back up. But that is such a crucial moment in my life with my son that I will never forget it. I know my, my dad is a godly man, but his dad and his grandfather and his great-grandfather I had to cut it off. I had to barn and five it. Nip that, I want to nip that curse in the bud. But I don't I do not want it to affect my grandson and my great grandson one of these days. Sunday, a day of worship. Pleasure should never take the place of God. Popularity should never be important. In fact, when you think of popularity, I know some of you are in it. I want to be the kid that everybody sees. Let me tell you something. The attitude of Jesus was this. I'm going to slide down and be humble. And put everybody else before me. That's what Jesus did. That's what he taught us to do. That I'm not first. God is first. Now others are second. And guess what? I'm at the bottom of the heap. That's the way it ought to be. So we have to teach them the danger of worshiping God wrong. False worship corrupts our minds. 
the sins of the father goes to the next generation and the next and the next. Let, let me give you a great example of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. And how the way that we worship has such a lasting impact upon our children. There's a king that come along, comes along in Exodus, uh, or in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. And this king's name is Uzziah. Remember him? And Uzziah, he, he, he kind of missed worship, so he had it in his mind one day that even though he was the most popular person in all this kingdom, and even though he was the king and he had all this authority and all of this power and all of this might behind him, he decided he's going to go to the temple and he's going to burn incense to God. Number one, that's a, that is a stinky thought. Because temple worship could only by God's dictate be led by a priest. He was a king. But he tried to do his priestly duty, which was wrong. It was so wrong. So he goes in and he burns this incense to God. And when the priests find out what he's doing, they run him out. But I'll tell you what happened to him. Before he ran out, guess what? His forehead showed signs of <coughs> leprosy. And it covered his body. And the Bible says that he was a leper until the day that he died and was buried in the valley. Uzziah <coughs> chose to worship God wrongly. And the next thing you know, his son comes into power. And his name was uh, uh, Jotham. And guess what? He knew what happened to his dad. He knew what caused it. And he said, I am never going to go into the temple. So guess what? Jotham never worshipped. Jehovah God. And he brought all these idols into the land for them to worship because he was not going to that temple to worship God. Uzziah worshiped God the wrong way. Guess what? Jotham began to worship God the wrong way or worship the wrong way. Then come Ahab, Jotham's son. And Ahab comes along and guess what? He's right there with his father and grandfather. Ahaz worshipped false gods, the Bible says. In fact, his worship was so wrong that he took holy vessels from the temple and destroyed them and shut up the house of God. Ahaz got so far from God, listen to me, so this is the fourth generation. He got so far from God, you know what he did? He decided that the, the false god Moab was more, more important to him than the Jehovah God. He started sacrificing his children. He threw his own children into the fire to worship the false god. I'm telling you that if you understand verse 5, you understand that God's a jealous God. And God sometimes gets very serious. He struck a man with leprosy and it went all the way down to a man in false worship. Worshiping Moloch. We have a philosophy that it doesn't matter what we do as long as it doesn't hurt someone. It's okay as long as we don't hurt someone. There is no such thing as solo sin. Do you know that? that? Sin never hurts just one person. Its result is affecting children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. We have to bite the curse. Let me tell you what, that's what Jesus did with sin. He broke the curse on the cross. That all that would call upon him would be saved. All that believe and trust in him, guess what? He'll give them a new life. And he, God who is a spirit, puts his spirit in us. God who is spirit puts his spirit in us. I want to say that right. He is not just a spirit. He is the spirit. So you know what happens? We read in the New Testament about the law of sowing and reaping. And every time, almost every time we use it, if you sow bad seed, guess what? You're going to have a bad crop. Well, let me ask you this. What if you sow good seed? What if you sow spiritual seed? Huh? Good crop. You know what? The principle is still the same. If you share, share good spiritual seed, guess what? You're going to get a good spiritual buffer crop. That's what you're going to get. So God says, I'll bless your socks off. You cannot even contain what I can pour out of heaven upon you. Not money, not fame, popularity, none of those things, but the blessing of God. So I'm going to ask you something. I have two boys. What's the greater blessing? That one, my youngest son is vice president of a company. 
you get rid of all the idols and false gods in your life, and you have only but one to worship, and guess what? Every time you pour out a blessing to him, it comes back. Twice as good. Three times as good. The Bible says up to ten times as good. Tenfold. Can you imagine? You can't get that at any bank or finance institution in the world. All you can get right now is about, what? Two percent if you. Uh, who knows? Two percent maybe for a hundred thousand dollars, million dollars, or whatever. Let me see something with God. If I give him a hundred percent, I'm getting two hundred. I may be getting ten thousand percent back because that's God. He's a jealous God. He's jealous over you because He had one son, one son, and He allowed that one son to fulfill God's purpose. The sovereign God in Genesis one one that was there in the beginning, whenever there was, there really wasn't a beginning of God. There always was God. But in Genesis, it could die. It's all wrapped up in what he did on the cross for us. That Jesus would make a sacrifice. God knew that from the beginning, that Adam was going to stumble and fall. God said, I got it already. Isn't that cool? I got it already. There was a fail-safe plan called Jesus, and it worked. Here's my question to you. Is Jehovah God that important? Love him with all of your heart, soul, and mind. If you do, then live it out. If you do, Father, teach your kids. And if the father doesn't have the backbone you mom, teach it to the kids to love God so tender. And if you don't know that God, Jehovah, the one and only, you can get to know him in a personal relationship called salvation. And I would encourage you, as I kneel here and pray in a moment, that you would ask him to forgive you. And that you would be willing to let go of absolutely everything that you're holding on to. And you would jump in his arms and say, Jesus, forgive me. I love you. Tonight. Please save me. And he will. Father, I come to you and I thank you so much for the blessing of the ten. Lord, what a what a huge roadmap you have provided for us to show us that there's an alternative path besides thou shalt not. You turn us away from danger here, you turn us away from tragedy there, and you lead us into your very presence, Father. Your word says if we truly love you, with that kind of love that you've asked for us, if we love you above all else, that we will follow your commandments. We'll keep your commandments. We'll do what you ask us. I pray that there are people here this morning that as they look at their life, as they search their heart, is Jesus really there? So maybe the question would be, which God am I serving? Of what kind of hand have I put in front of God? I thank you that your mercy endures forever. And I thank you that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from every unrighteous sin. Stand with me, Jim.